Welcome back to the um, equine anatomy lectures. Um, uh, continuing on the anatomy of the equine forelimb, uh, we started uh, with uh, mentioning the clinical relevance of the topic uh, by naming a few clinical cases that affect the uh, forelimb. And then after that, we talked about the different articulations and we talked about uh, the uh, muscles and uh, innervation of those muscles as well as some clinical cases associated with the injury to those uh, nerves. Uh, then we talked about the uh, passive stay apparatus of the uh, shoulder, elbow, and uh, uh, carpus. Uh, then we talked about a number of muscles that we are interested in uh, from a clinical standpoint, such as the extensor carpi radialis and the common digital extensor and the um, uh, deep and superficial digital uh, flexor uh, muscles. Uh, then we talked about the metacarpal area and we uh, mentioned the number of tendons that uh, we can see both on the dorsal and on the uh, ventral aspect of the metacarpus. And then we reached uh, at this point the, um, uh, the digit. So, so today I'm going to start talking about the digit. The, um, the, the digit uh, basically consists of um, uh, three articulations, uh, three articulations, namely the fetlock joint, which is an articulation between the distal end of the third uh, metacarpal bone or the cannon bone, the proximal sesamoid bones can be seen better here in this picture. This is one, this is, uh, this is medial, this is lateral, and uh, the uh, proximal a, um, a pastern uh, or the long pastern bone or the first phalanx. Uh, this is the fetlock joint. Uh, the second joint in the digit is the pastern joint, which is an articulation between P1 and P2, the long and the short pastern uh, bones. The third joint in the, um, in the digit is called the coffin. Uh, joint. The coffin joint is an articulation between the um, uh, second phalanx and the third phalanx, which is the coffin bone, uh, or P3, uh, as well as the distal navicular bone, which is uh, the distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone. So in the digit, we have three articulations, fetlock, pastern, and coffin. Fetlock, pastern, and coffin. Fetlock is an articulation between the distal end of the cannon bone, the proximal sesamoid bones, and P1. The pastern joint is an articulation between P1 and P2. The coffin joint is an articulation between P2, P3, and the distal sesamoid bone, also known as the, um, the um, uh, navicular bone. Uh, some of the clinical cases that affect uh, the um, the uh, the digit, we start with the fetlock joint. Uh, we have sesamoiditis, uh, inflammation of the uh, medial and lateral sesamoid bones. Medial and lateral sesamoid bones. Uh, this inflammation of the bones, it's osteomyelitis basically, and it's best seen by a technique called a um, um, a nuclear scintigraphy. Uh, it's by injecting a, uh, an iodine-125 radioactive um, isotope, and we can detect the uh, hot areas or the areas that has increased blood supply uh, on on a on a on a picture, and we can take a look at uh, the uh, the inflamed areas, such as seen in this picture here. This is a picture of nuclear scintigraphy. This is the radiograph, of course, and this is the scintigraphy. You can see the hot area or the area with increased blood supply, which means inflammation in this area. This is the sesamoid bone. We can take a look here, and also we can see that both sesamoid bones are um, inflamed. Um, another case that affects the fetlock uh, joint is the, the uh, chip fractures. Chip fractures basically due to continuous irritation and stress on the on the distal uh, end of the uh, cannon bone, which which also uh, cause um, uh, microfractures that can be floating in the uh, 
in the synovial fluid uh, of the joint and of the joint capsule and this can be taken of course uh, uh, arthroscopically um, and now now injecting injecting the the, the fetlock joint is is also an important thing we'll talk about late, this later um, we we should do that when the when the uh, joint is flexed when we uh, flex the, the 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 fetlock joint and the needle should go in the area between the distal end of the um, uh, splint bones two and four the uh, metacarpal bones two and four or the splint bones and the uh, 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 proximal end of the sesamoid uh, yeah, proximal sesamoid uh, bones in in this area right here you can we, we can we can inject the uh, the uh, coffin uh, joint because it has a large uh, joint capsule uh, basically um, we'll talk about that later in details um, and now we're going to go to the to the pastern joint so so the pastern joint as i mentioned earlier it's an articulation between p1 or the long pastern bone and p2 the short pastern bone this is the joint uh, right here and uh, there are uh, you know a couple of clinical cases that are associated with with this uh, uh, joint and these are called high and low ring bone it's basically uh, uh, bone formation new pore formation this is a high ring bone which is which is basically at the uh, high level of the uh, uh, low pastern bone the pa the, which is p2 uh, we see a lot of bony formation uh, in, in in this area um, that we we call high ring bone. Uh, on the other hand, when this bony formation occur at the lower level of P2, which is the short pastern bone, we call that low ring bone. Now, th this is th this is the extent of the of the pastern joint that I'm going to talk about. Um, the last joint in the digit is called the coffin joint. This is the coffin joint right here. This is the coffin joint right here. And the coffin joint is an articulation between the distal end of P2, the proximal end of P3, or the coffin bone, number 22 here, and the distal sesamoid bone, the distal sesamoid bone, or also known as the navicular bone also known as the navicular bone so the coffin joint the coffin joint is the last joint in the in the in the forelimb and it uh, is an articulation between p2 number 14 here p3 number 22 and the distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone which is number 17 here so 14 17 and 22 and the joint is number 20 right here and um, so so the clinical significance is in this joint first let's talk about how we are going to inject the joint injecting the joint i mentioned this earlier is basically on the medial or on the lateral aspect of the extensor process of p3 extensor process of p3 and we all remember that the extensor process is also where pyramid disease takes place or occur, occurs. And uh, also it's the place where you have insertion of the only tendon that reaches the, uh, the distal end of the, of the forelimb, which is, uh, to, which is P3 basically. And that structure is the common digital extensor. In the hind limb, we call it the long digital extensor, but in the fore limb, we call it the common digital extensor. So common in the fore, long in the hind limb. Okay, so so the extensor process is an important part of of of, um, of the cuff and joint, and uh, on either side, as I mentioned, we have to inject the cuff and joint. So it's a landmark. The other thing that happens is pyramid disease pyramid disease or calcification of of, uh, of this area right here uh, made, makes a pyramid when we look at it and on radiographs. Uh, the other thing that happened is sometimes this extensor process fractures. Just like any other bone can see that the chip fracture of the of P3 is right here. 
and we can take that surgically, of course, and, and we, we clean the area. Uh, now, in, in addition to the articulation between, uh, as you can see here, between P2 and P3, this is the joint space, and the distal uh, uh, sesamoid bone or the navicular bone, we also have a structure here from each side of the, of the hook, and we call that the cartilages of P3. Here are the cartilages of P3 on both sides, medial and lateral aspects of P3, and they cover basically uh, the the sides uh, all the all the way all the uh, the the uh, cuff and uh, joint. They cuff and the, they cover it from both medial and uh, the uh, lateral uh, aspects. In between them, we have what we call a digital cushion. This structure right here is we call a digital cushion. The digital cushion basically covers the a uh, the navicular bone as well o also as the a uh, distal end of the deep digital flexor tendon, which basically is the only tendon that uh, inserts on P3 or the distal end of the forelimb um, uh, uh, from the palmar aspect. On the dorsal aspect we have the common digital extensor or the long digital extensor in case of the hind limb. However, in the uh, ventral or the palmar aspect of, of, the, of the digit, we have the uh, um, deep digital flexor tendon, which is covered by uh, the, the digital cushion that's located between the two cartilages of uh, uh, P3. And sometimes we call those the alar cartilages, by the way. The, 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 the two uh, cartilages of P3, we call them alar cartilages, alar cartilages. Sometimes they get infected, by the way, such as in this case here, uh, the alar cartilages infection, this is pus coming out of the uh, uh, cartilages. We call this, this case quitter. Uh, quitter is basically necrosis of the hoof uh, uh, alar uh, cartilages. Sometimes, if, if the case is more and more uh, chronic, uh, they become calcified. They became like they become like bone, and and we call that side bone. This is a case of side bone. These are the alar cartilages one and two, medial and lateral, and we can see here a cal complete calcification of these alar cartilages. And instead of being a cartilaginous material, they become bone. And and this case we call a um, a, a side bone. Not ring bone, but side bone. Okay, so we talked about a few cases in the in the calf and joint. Now let's talk about the the joint itself and the component of the joint and how they are associated with each other and how this is clinically important. So okay, so th this is another another picture showing uh, P1 or the long pastern, the pastern joint, P2 or the short pastern bone, the coffin joint, the navicular bone, and or the distal sesamoid bone, and the third phalanx or the coffin bone. Here's the hoof wall, the hoof, and this is the digital cushion that's covering both the navicular bone and also the distal end of the deep digital flexor tendon which is the only tendon that inserts on p3 the only tendon that inserts on p3 we'll see more pictures of that pretty soon uh, this is the superficial digital flexor which basically inserts on p1 and p2 the palmar aspects of p1 and p2 the, the, the joint that we are concerned about now is the coffin joint. This joint right here, which is an articulation between P2, P3, and the distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone. So this is the joint that we will be talking about here. One of the most components of this, of this coffin joint is the navicular bone, the distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone. Why? Because we will talk about a navicular disease and a navicular bursitis pretty soon. So, then distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone 
is basically part of the articulation of the coffin joint between P2 and P3, the coffin bone. Now, this bone is also covered, as you can see, by the, um, the um, uh, uh, distal end of uh, the uh, deep digital flexor tendon, as well as the digital cushion, as well as the digital cushion. So it's protected. The navicular bone, which is basically here, the navicular bone, navicular means boat, like a boat that, that, that you know, that, that we, uh, we, we see in rivers. So basically, basically this, this boat is covered with, with, um, uh, uh, the distal end of the deep digital flexor tendon, as well as the, um, the, um, digital, uh, cushion. This is a lateral view here, and this is a, Palmer view right here. Now, um, under underneath it, underneath it, there is a bursa. There is a a bursa. Um, this picture shows the the uh, the bursa uh, better. So so this is this is P two. This is P three. This is the coffin joint, and this is the navicular bone. This is the navicular bone. Now, the navicular bone is attached to P3 by a structure that's called the impar ligament. The impar ligament. This little structure right here attaches these fibers, attaches the, uh, these are bony fibers, by the way. They, they attach uh, the 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 uh, navicular bone or the distal sesamoid bone with P3. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the navicular bone, you have also you have also um, the it's covered by the distal end of the deep digital flexor tendon. Now, between the deep digital flexor tendon and the navicular bone, there's a very narrow area. That's called the navicular bursa, shown shown here in blue. Shown here in blue, and sometimes this this bursa gets infected, and we have to to uh, to uh, inject it uh, with antibi uh, antibiotics and uh, or drain it. And and so and so the most important thing is to know where this bursa is located and how to get access to it. It's located between the navicular bone and the deep digital flexor tendon, the, the space between the navicular bone and the deep digital flexor tendon. Covered, of course, by the digital, by the digital cushion, which when we want to inject, we try to uh, go dorsal to that uh, uh, cushion about 45 degrees in order for us to get to the, to the, uh, um, uh, navicular bursa. This is this is how to get to the navicular bursa, a 45 degree angle. And yes, you have to go through the the, um, the deep digital flexor tendon. So you have to be very careful in this area, so you won't tear the the um, the, um, the the distal end of the deep digital uh, flexor. Uh, of course, when when we do that, it's always better to um, uh, take some radiographs to confirm that our needle is in the right spot. This is basically what we what we see uh, the needle going. Uh, this area is basically the best the best view that you can get from from uh, from uh, a radiograph. Uh, especially especially here, you can see that this is the navicular uh, uh, bone or the distal sesamoid bone, and this is P3, this is P2, and this is the coffin joint. The deep digital flexor tendon will be in this area right here. Of course, it's not going to appear on radiographs because it's a tendon. So, so, so the needle is in the very right spot between the navicular bone and the deep digital flexor tendon, which again, we cannot see it in this picture. We only can see the bone on the radiograph. So, so this is a very important uh, injection that we, we have to uh, 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 perform. Another thing, as I mentioned, is the fact that the, the navicular bone is attached with the uh, uh, impar ligament to P3. This is 
this is here uh, the same picture that you've seen earlier and this is where the navicular bursa is between the navicular bone and the distal end of the deep digital flexor now the impar ligament is this area right here shown in white here and it's the impar ligament the impar ligament is basically a a collection of of uh, 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 bony fibers, if you will, that connects the bone to bone. Uh, uh, yeah, we call that Sharpie's fibers. Uh, the the uh, the navicular bone is attached by these Sharpie's fibers by this impar ligament, which makes Sharpie's fibers, uh, or fi or the fibers makes the, the the ligament. It connects. It's the super glue that connects the 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 um, the uh, navicular bone to the to uh, P3. Now sometimes this this impar ligament gets ruptured. We call that evulsion of of the um, of the impar of the impar uh, um, uh, ligament. Uh, so rupture of the impar ligament. We have to to you know and and, and this requires uh, uh, basically conservative therapy to to uh, to to keep the foot in minimum motion so we can so so the fibers can. Can basically uh, regenerate and a uh, yeah, uh, healing process can take place. Uh, now, now another thing about the impar ligament or the Sharpie's fibers that form the impar ligament is that in the normal conditions, uh, you, you have teeny tiny areas where the impar ligaments basically penetrate from the from the the, the navicular bone to the uh, um, to to P three. That's how they're going to be. Uh, 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 attaching the navicular bone to P3. So we can see these little spaces where the Sharpie's fibers penetrate on P3 and the navicular bone, of course. So now when, when you have, when you have a lesion, when you have a lesion on, uh, uh, that, that affects these sh Sharpie's fibers, they get necrotic, they die and Osteoclasts, or the, the 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 cells that eats the the bone uh, to to basically clean the area, the osteoclasts, or the, the 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 cells that clean all the dead cells of the bone, we call those osteoclasts. The ones that form the bone, we call them osteoblasts. Uh, the ones with which eats the dead tissue, the dead bony tissue, we call that osteoclast. So they start eating. The, the, uh, the, the ruptured area, not in the normal situation, but in the disease area, in the disease situation, they start eating, eating up these, uh, uh, these, uh, bony, uh, uh, areas, the dead bony spaces where the, where the Sharpie's fibers got attached, basically, and they form shapes like this that we can see in, ra on radiographs and also on the actual bone, on the navicular bone. Uh, this basically a, a pretty important sign for navicular disease. Navicular disease. We have we have to, to remember we call those vascular channels, these large black circles or holes, if you will. We call that vascular channels. And so so you can see these here. One, two, three, four, five, and you can see them here on the radiograph one, two, three, and four, and 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 so and so uh, these are the areas on the navicular bone that Sharpie's fibers from the impar ligament or of the impar ligament penetrate these 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 uh, uh, holes to a uh, uh, basically um, attach the navicular bone. to P3, the navicular bone, to P3. Now, when, in cases of navicular disease, when there's degenerative changes in the navicular bone, here, the Sharpie's fiber starts to die, start to die. And so when they start to die, the osteoclasts come to clean up the area. And when they clean up the area, they, they, they start to make bigger holes and bigger holes.
So instead of the small holes that Sharpie's fibers uh, have on the navicular bone to penetrate the navicular bone to attach it to P3, and instead of that, when the fibers die, osteoclast starts to eat up this uh, little area to become bigger area and bigger and bigger holes. When they become bigger areas or bigger hole, we call that vascular channels, vascular channels, but they don't have blood supply. These are just, the, the, the name is only uh, vascular uh, uh, channels. Now, the best way to, 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 um, to diagnose this is with hoof testing. Uh, hoof testing is basically the best way to, to, uh, to, to diagnose, or the, the, the first uh, uh, diagnostic method, if you will. Not the best, but the, the, the first diagnostic method to, to, um, to, um, to diagnose navicular disease. So this is, this is a hoof tester, and the examiner is, is putting some pressure on both sides on both sides of the navicular bone right here to see if the if the horse react if the horse react to pain if the horse reacts the horse will show you it will it will flinch so 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 basically what happens is that this is the first uh, diagnostic uh, method to uh, to um, to uh, uh, diagnose uh, navicular disease of course you have you have other methods you have uh, the radiograph to see that's in the advanced cases if you will uh, but also you have also nuclear scintigraphy as i mentioned the technique earlier by injecting by injecting uh, uh, radioactive uh, iodine 125 which is an isotope that's radioactive and when you give it intravenously to the horse and wait few uh, uh, a few minutes you start taking uh, pictures uh, the hot area or the area with high blood uh, supply because of the inflammation Will appear like this on the on the um, on the on the film, and and so that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good diagnostic uh, uh, technique uh, to to diagnose uh, to diagnose uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the navicular bone. Um, it, I also wanted to mention here one point about the navicular bone, and that is and that is a. Uh, 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 um, it, usually it happens in older horses because it's a degenerative joint uh, disease it's it's an arthritic change it it it, 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 it mostly happens in, in older horses so we're talking about 15 18 20 25 etc so so uh, remember when you have a case history like like an older horse uh, with with pain and lameness and things like that then you think about navicular disease and usually not in in a young not not in a young horse uh, there are other techniques to diagnose the disease as well another technique to to diagnose a navicular disease is thermography and basically that also tests the hot areas or the areas with high blood supply the the, the warm areas and it shows different colors when the when the hot area um, is is present you can see here it's it's pink compared to to the red areas or the or the yellow and the and the green bluish areas which are cold areas basically so this area the navicular area has has a high blood supply here which means there is an inflammation in that area and another another technique which is a very basic technique is is basically when the horse is lame is to is to do uh, nerve block we call that uh, Palmer uh, digital nerve block or PD nerve block uh, PD nerve block is basically to to uh, to anesthetize uh, the two uh, Palmer digital nerves uh, on both sides of the of the uh, uh, coffin uh, joint this is number one and the other is from the other side now now when we Palmer digital uh, 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 anesthetize uh, the these two nerves the horse becomes sound and it it becomes uh, it's it's it uh, no lameness is going to be shown and everything so so the horse is going to walk pretty comfortably and pretty happy so that's a diagnostic test to see that the horse is basically having a problem that uh, that uh, again you have to go with also other tests trader graphs uh, uh, and, and, and nuclear scintigraphy, other things, uh, uh, other than just the the nerve block. But this is one of the 
one of the cheap area cheap tests if you will to 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 diagnose to to confirm the disease and one of the treatment options to treat the disease also is to cut these uh, uh nerves we call that palmar digital uh, neurectomy palmar digital neurectomy uh, next time i'll talk to you more about the palmar digital neurectomy and how how the procedure is done and what we can do to to uh, to uh, you know to avoid any um, any problems with this um, uh, surgery so next time we'll talk about palmar digital neurectomy